welcome once again to Takuma Island Online. Can you believe it's September already? I know. Wow. And probably school starts yeah. this week. Yeah, some people may have, it may have already started. That's that's true. In some places, school does start earlier than Lake Bridget. But anyway, this week we've got another awesome program. Yes. This so week we're, we're continuing working. talking about the Word of God. And we talked about um, don't live like the Word of God. Uh, respect the Word of God, um, read the Word of God and do what it says. Then we saw an example last week of Joshua. And then, so today we're going to take a look at a miracle that Jesus did, uh, where people were really hungry and needed physical food. And so once again, he did a miracle to kind of show that just like we need physical food to help us live our lives, we need spiritual food, the Word of God, to help us live our spiritual lives. All right. So... I guess with that said, we'll just yeah, let you this, listen. This is to one of my, my favorite Jesus stories. Okay, well, we'll catch you back at the end. See you at the end. think of it being as anything that's deadly or uh, a problem. They just kind of crawl, kind of slimy, that kind of thing. But did you know there is a snail called a cone snail that is actually deadly? It has poison in it. And what it'll do is it will kind of settle itself down into the dirt so you really can't see it. And scientists believe that it kind of puts out a chemical around it that when fish swim by it, it kind of make some drowsy, kind of sleepy, so they don't move a whole lot. And then he's actually, somehow he has a harpoon on a string inside of him, and he spit that out, and it'll go into the fish, and then he'll pull it in and eat the fish. He uses deception 
to get his meals. A creature that you don't think is deadly in some ways can become deadly. That's the way deception is. The Bible tells us that Satan is a deceiver. He wants to trick you. He wants to get you to think wrong thoughts about God and stop you from believing in God and serving God. Some of his lies and deceptions are pretty believable. That's why it's so important to, to take time to read the Word, to get to know God, to spend time with Him. And the more time you spend with God, the more you'll be able to see the deceptions that come from the enemy. It's a happy day, and I praise God for the weather. I'll never get it done. What's the use, anyway? What's up, Skip? Why the long face? Oh, it's just that we're having this contest in Sunday school. Everyone has lots of points except me. I'll never get enough. It's too hard. I haven't heard about any contests. Tell me all about it. You have to read the Bible and then learn a new verse every week. When you read a chapter, you get ten points. The verse usually isn't too bad, but that reading, ugh. Wait, Skip. Remember last month when you ran home from school as fast as you could every day? You wouldn't even stop to say hi. Sure, my birthday was coming up. Almost every single day I got something in the mail. I had to get home in a hurry to see my letters and cards. That's right. But weren't you waiting for a special one? Yep, my grandma's. Last year, I got two tickets to the circus, and this time, she wrote that she was coming to visit. Letters from her are the best. Okay. I've got a good idea for your birthday next year. What's that? Well, when your grandma's card comes, don't open it. Don't even peek inside or shake it. As soon as you get it, just put it on a shelf. What? I couldn't do that. There might even be money in it. That would be dumb. That's right. It wouldn't make any sense. You love your grandma and want to see what she wrote. Yeah. Boy, would that be dumb. She'd feel bad, too, if she knew I'd done that. I think God would feel the same way if you didn't read his letter. A letter from God? Yeah. God's Word, the Bible, is sort of a letter from Him. The Bible was written so you could read and see how much He loves you. In fact, it's full of special things just for us to find. Hey, the Bible is like God's letter? I've never read very much of it. That's almost as bad as putting it on a shelf without ever looking at it, isn't it? Right. Reading God's Word can be exciting, and even more fun than your grandma's birthday card. Hey, where are you going? I've got to hurry. Thanks for helping me, Mr. Quimper. I know I have the best letter of all at home waiting to be read. Hmm. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a happy day, and I'm living it for my Lord. When Jesus was on the earth, he did a lot of miracles. Some of them were pretty amazing. But every miracle that he did, he had a specific purpose for it. And so this, today what I want to do is I want to talk about one of those miracles that Jesus did. But before we get to the actual miracle itself, I need to give you a little bit of background what's going on. So in Mark chapter 6, uh, Jesus and the disciples had been traveling around. Jesus was teaching and um, you know, doing miracles, or healing people that were sick, um, giving sight to the blind, all that kind of stuff. And so it says, Jesus went around teaching village to village. He called the twelve to him. And he began to send them out two by two. So he said, I've been doing this now, going around. We've been going together, talking you know, talking about God, teaching that kind of stuff. Now it's your turn. You've watched me do it. 
I've told you how to do it. Now you guys are going out. So he sent them out two by two. He says uh, he gave them authority over impure spirits. These were instructions. Take nothing for your journey except for your staff, your walking stick. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. So basically, just as you're dressed right now, take a staff, a walking stick, and go. No money, nothing. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. If any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So he sent them out, they had nothing. Which meant they had to trust God for their food for every single day. They didn't have money to buy food. They didn't have Jesus right there with them physically to rely upon him. Just the other disciple that went with them. Two by two they went out. And they went out and they began to preach. And it says, uh, they preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons, anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So it doesn't say exactly how long this went, but probably went on for at least a couple of weeks. So these guys were out busy working. Now normally, they were the ones that were in the background, and Jesus was the one doing all the teaching. Now they're the ones that are out there doing the teaching. And I imagine they're having a great time. They're seeing God do some pretty amazing things. But yet when you're out ministering like that on a regular basis... It can get very uh, exhausting. And so finally it came time and uh, they got done with it. And then they gathered back around Jesus. It says, we reported them all that they had done and taught. So they came back and they're excited. They're wound up because they saw God do so many amazing, mighty things. And they want to get together with Jesus and they want to tell him all the stuff that God did. But as they're talking... There are more and more people that are coming. Because one of the things, when you read through the Gospels, you'll discover that the only way Jesus could have alone time was if he got up really early and went off by himself. Because if people knew he was around, they were there to see him. And so more and more people gathered around. And before long, there was a huge crowd around. Jesus could not just focus on the twelve. He began to teach them. The twelve didn't just sit around and listen to Jesus' teaching. The twelve were responsible for taking care of the people in the crowd. And so what that meant was, instead of just coming and relaxing with Jesus and having a good time with him, they had to go to work. Now, I don't think they were really upset about it because they were still excited about everything that God had done. They're a little disappointed they couldn't spend time with Jesus, but there are people here, they need help. It says that he, he taught them all day long. This was early in the morning when they gathered around Jesus, and the day went on, and Jesus continued to teach. And that meant the apostles were doing work while Jesus was teaching. They were helping people. They were you know making sure that the, the crowd was in line and handling issues and problems and stuff. So they're probably on their feet walking around all day. They were tired from all the work they've been doing for the last several weeks. And now they got another day on top of that. They thought they were going to rest, but they're not resting. And so it says, they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Jesus realized what was going on. He said to the guy, okay, guys, tell you what. Let's send the people away. Let's get in the boat. Let's go to the other side of the sea. We'll have some time together. And so I can just imagine how excited they were. So they sent the crowd away. They got in the boat. And they, they left and they went over to the other side. And I can imagine that must have been a pretty cool boat ride. Just the 13 of them in the boat. Finally a chance to relax. Nobody coming and asking Jesus for anything. Just the 12 of them with Jesus. Had to have been an amazing ride over. They weren't in a big hurry to get there, so they weren't, you know, rowing really hard and fast. They were able to just take their time and cross to the other side of the sea. And I'm sure that they were looking for a day when they could have Jesus to themselves. But the problem is, many who saw them leaving recognized them, 
they they saw where they were heading and so they ran out on foot and and they ran around the edge of the sea and kind of figured out where he's going to land and so they, Jesus was going by the water they were going by the land they were running around to meet him there on the other side and as they drew close to the other side instead of having just an empty beach it was full of thousands of people when Jesus landed and saw the large, large crowd he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd so he began teaching them many things and now the disciples got to be hard for them because they've been busy they've been active for a number of weeks in a row they thought they were going to get a break but then they had to work another day and finally they were in the boat with Jesus they would let their guard down they would begin to relax thinking we're going to have a full day where we don't have to do anything but we can spend time with Jesus and when they get to the other side they realize we got a whole day of work ahead of us. We've got another whole crowd that we've got to take care of. Because they knew Jesus was not going to turn them away. Jesus never turned away anybody who came to him. But it's kind of interesting. I imagine maybe to begin with, they were a little upset at the crowd, at the people. Because they, they weren't going to get the rest that they thought they were going to get, that maybe they thought they needed. But as they began to minister to the people and work with the people, they, they got into it. And they realized these people need help. To the point that Jesus taught all morning long into the afternoon, all the way to early evening. And as the disciples are working and helping all the, these people out, they realize there's a big problem here. Most of these people just walked here. They didn't pack a lunch. They didn't pack any food with them. They've been here all day. They haven't had anything to eat. And now they've got a long walk back to their house. They realize there's a problem. And when they realize there's a problem, they did the right thing. They took the problem to Jesus. But when they took the problem to Jesus, they did do something wrong. When they came to Jesus, instead of just giving him the problem and looking for his answer, they brought their own answer with them. And so it says, By this time it was late in the day, the disciples said to him, This is a remote place. It's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Sounds like a plan. Simple thing to do. Send them away. There's enough villages around that they could probably find something to eat. That wasn't Jesus' plan. Now, picture yourself as you're one of those disciples. You're concerned about these people because they've had nothing to eat all day. And uh, they don't have the, the energy to be able to walk all the way back home. So they've got to find some place where they can buy some food. And so you're coming to Jesus saying, Jesus, you know, we need to wrap this up, send these people home. Because they've got to get some food. But then he looks right at the disciples. Maybe even pointed his finger at them and said, you give them something to eat. You know what Jesus was asking them to do? He was asking them to do something that was impossible. They didn't have enough food to feed this crowd. How were they going to do it? But when Jesus looked at them and said, you give them something to eat, they realized he was being serious. He wasn't just playing games, joking around with them. He was serious. And so they said to him, that would take more than half a year's wage. Are we to go out and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Besides that, is there going to be enough? There's no stores around where we can buy enough bread to feed all of this crowd. What you're asking, Jesus, is impossible. So Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. So they went through the whole crowd. And as they went through the whole crowd, they found one boy that had enough food for one meal. Five loaves of bread and two small fish. Now when we think of a loaf of bread, we think of you know, a big long loaf cut up in slices. No, a loaf of bread was a small flat piece, almost like a pancake, like a pita bread. And then they would take the fish, they would break it up, put it on it, roll it up, and then they would eat it. Enough food for one boy for one meal. They brought that to Jesus. And they said, this is what we have. How, you know, how, how can this be anything among all these people? 
how can we feed these people with just this little bit of food? Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. They must have been wondering, what in the world is he doing? He's acting like he's going to take this meal and feed all of these people with it. He said, have them sit down. So they went about having people sit down in groups of 100, group of 50. So that would take some time to organize all that, get into people, because the people were asking what's going on. You know, it wasn't just somebody sit down and they just did it. They were hungry. They were wondering what's going on. Are we going to get something to eat? And so I'm sure they had all kinds of questions, and the disciples had to get them calm, settle them down, and get them seated. So they are able to do that. And then it says, taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. I think it would be so cool if we could be there to see the looks on the disciples' faces. As Jesus is taking this lunch, enough food for one boy for one meal. And he's got, the Bible says, 5,000 men plus the women and children. So there are probably easily 15, 20,000 people sitting in front of him. And Jesus is holding this one lunch for one boy, looking up to heaven and giving thanks as though it's going to feed everybody in that group. And I'm sure the disciples must have been wondering, what in the world is he doing? But then it says, he broke the loaves, and he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. So they gathered some, got some baskets. Jesus took those five loaves of bread, two fish, began to break off pieces of the bread, began to just, you know, break off the fish. He filled a whole basket, gave it to one of the disciples, they left. Filled another basket, gave it to that disciple, he left. Filled another basket, third disciple that left. Filled up 12 baskets. And by the time he filled up the 12th basket, the first one was there ready for some more. And they continued that process where Jesus broke off pieces of the fish and bread, filled baskets, the disciples took the bread and gave it to the people. He didn't have to do it that way. He could have simply said, everybody sit down, hold out your hands, and snapped his fingers, and the plate of food would be in there, in their hands. He could have even skipped that, and he could have just simply said, okay, go home, you're all full. And the food would be instantly in their stomach. He could have done it any way that he wanted to. But he did it this way. Why did he do it this way? Because if you remember, when the disciples asked him, send these people away that they can buy food, what did Jesus say to them? He said, you feed them. He told them to do what was impossible. But then, when it actually came down to it, they did the impossible. The disciples were the ones that fed, the, that gave the food to that crowd, that fed that crowd. You see, when you take time, to get to know God. Spend time in His Word. Spend time reading it, thinking about what it has to say, and then doing it. Jesus will do the same thing for you. He will give you the ability to do whatever it is He asks you to do. The disciples did the impossible. And it says, they all ate and were satisfied. That means Everybody had as much as they wanted. If somebody was really, really hungry, he could eat a whole bunch, he got as much as he wanted. And then, Jesus said, after everybody was done, he said, we don't want to be wasteful, go around and pick up whatever food is left over. So they each took a basket, went around, and they picked up all the food that was left over, and all 12 of them came back with a basket full of food. It says the number of men who had eaten were about 5,000. So probably easily 15,000 people there, kind of the women and children. Well, they have these 12 baskets of food. The Bible doesn't say what they did with it. A lot of people think, well, 12 baskets, each one of the disciples had a basket. That was probably their food for the next couple of days. But yet there's a principle in the Word of God that says that you cannot outgive God. What I believe is that those disciples took those 12 baskets and gave them to that little boy who willingly gave up his lunch so that everybody else could, live, could eat. Well, as we look at this story, 
A lot of things we can learn from it. But one of the biggest things we, we can take away from it today is Jesus asked the disciples to do something that was impossible. And when you read the Word of God, and when you think about what it says, and you think about what God wants you to do, you may say, I can't do that. It's too hard. It's impossible. But if you'll take the step of faith and begin doing what God tells you to do, He will give you the ability to do even the impossible. It's amazing when that happens. And so the bottom line, once again, we've been talking about this over and over again. The bottom line is, you need to spend time reading the book, the Bible, every day. You need to spend time thinking about what it has to say. And then spend time doing what you know God wants you to do. What he's told you to do as you've read the Bible. And as you do that, God's going to help you to do things that are impossible. But also, if you go way back to the book of Joshua, chapter 1, God says, if you will do that, you will be successful and will prosper in your life. So once again, the question comes down to, is, what are you going to do with this book? Are you going to ignore it? Are you going to put off reading it? Or will you make a commitment to start reading the Word every single day. Doesn't have to be a huge part, but just read some of the Bible every day. Think about what you've read, and then ask God to help you to do it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 7, it says, all streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. So, did you ever stop to think about that? That you have the sea level, and then you have all this water that keeps flowing into it from the streams and that kind of stuff, and yet it doesn't get higher and higher and higher and higher, it stays the same. So why does that happen? Well, here I have a container of water. Okay, so if I was to take that water and I was just to leave it here, for a couple days, what would happen? The water level would start to go down. Why? Because it would evaporate. So with the sun hitting it and the heat and stuff, it would evaporate so some of that water would leave. It would go up, it goes up into the air, goes up into the sky, and it forms the clouds. And then when enough water vapor clubs up there, then it comes down in the form of rain. And so it's a cycle that God set up so that the sea level, the water flows in, but water evaporates, and so the sea stays the same level. But did you ever stop and think about how much water is really on this planet? There's a lot of water in the lakes, and the streams, the ponds, the rivers, and the oceans, but there's other places where there's water too. So let me set this aside here, and I have a container here. This container is gonna represent just the ground. What is underneath the ground? Well, there's rocks and dirt. So I'm going to put some rocks in there. Okay, so those are some good sized ones because usually way down the bottom there's you know bigger rocks that are like the bedrock. And then on top of that, well, let me throw one more in there. And then you have smaller rocks. So we'll put some of these in there. Okay. So it's getting kind of full, so we we'll put some of these smaller ones. So now we've got our container full of rocks. So is that full? Well, you'd say, yeah, in fact, it's, uh, I can put a few more in there. But if I put any more in, they're going to be overflowing. So we can say that container is full. But is it really? What happens if I take some of this water and then I pour the water in there? Okay. So there's more, the water is going in and it's starting to fill it up. 
Now, that's kind of interesting. Now we can say this is full. But that container looked like it was full with all the rocks, but I started off with four cups of water and I'm down just a little bit above two cups, so I've got almost two cups of water inside that container there. And that's what happens when it rains and the, the ground gets wet, what does the water do? It absorbs down into the ground. And so underneath the ground, there is water that is filling up spaces. So there's a lot of water around. When I poured the water in, why didn't it just start at the top and overflow? Well, because there's space in between those rocks and the water as a liquid kind of fills down and through in between those spaces and fills it up. So again, if you see how much, you know, almost two cups of water is in just this little bit, how much water there must be under the ground around this building, you know, around your house, in the town that you live in, and that kind of stuff, a lot of water is stored underground. So why are we talking about this? Well, in the Bible, when it says that God created the heavens and the earth, he didn't just guess how to do it. He knew how to do it. And so when he created the heavens and the earth, there's a lot of stuff that you know, we don't even think about that goes into it. He had to provide water for us. How is he going to provide that water for us? And so he made you know, the cycle of the water vaporizing and evaporating and that kind of stuff. He made that cycle on purpose. He put the water in the ground so that we could dig wells and get to it easy. So when God created everything, he was thinking about us the entire time and how he could better help us. You see, God thinks about you. In fact, the Bible says that God has amazing thoughts towards you. He thinks about you all the time and he wants to have a relationship with you. And as you come to know Jesus as your Savior, and then as you spend time reading the Word of God, thinking about what it says, and doing what it says, you can develop that relationship with God. Water is what we need to live our lives. But that relationship with God is what you need to have an abundant, joy-filled life. Will you choose to dig into the Word of God and learn more about Him and do what it has to say so that you can have an abundant life? So this is pretty cool. Yes. Uh, each night so far we've been talking about how to have a relationship with right. God. Right. So in case they you know, haven't seen it so far, I thought we'd use a kind of a cool little thing. Uh, it's called a Herman grid. Herman. I think, uh, I think the, the guy that kind of invented it, his last name was Herman. So but basically, it's just a paper with a bunch of windows. Kind of a grid. Kind of a grid, that's right. Now, we're going to let this represent us. Okay. Now, the Bible tells us, in Romans 3.23, it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means that everyone has done wrong things. Right. And in the Bible, um, darkness is used to talk about sin and light is used to talk about God. So the Bible says that men love darkness because their deeds were evil. So I'm gonna take this dark piece of paper and put it in here to show that we have sin in our lives. The Bible says when we were born, we were born sinners. So you see um, the dark squares, right? Yes. Um, pretty obvious. But what do you see in between there when you look at it really close? Dots. There are gray dots. Yeah. But are those gray dots really there? No. No, they're just kind of showing through. Sometimes we get the idea that we can hide our sins. Mm. And that usually we, doesn't work very well. Not usually. We may be able to hide them from some people. Occasionally, maybe be able to hide them from our parents, that kind of thing. But they have a tendency of finding out. Right. We but there's somebody hide from God. Though. There's somebody we can never hide our sins from, and that is God. God. That's right. So. Sin is a problem because the Bible tells us that sin separates us from God, that there's a penalty for sin. 
And that penalty is to be separated from God for how long? Forever. Forever and ever. So does God want us to be separated from him forever? No. No. Do we want to be separated from him forever? No. No. So in order for us not to be separated from God, what do we got to do? We, we got to get, get rid, rid of our sin problem. Sin. Yeah. The problem is there's nothing we can do to get rid of it. You know, no matter how, how hard you try to be good, the sin is already there. And so you can be really good, but it's not going to help you get to heaven. That's right. You know, can you, if you had enough money, could you buy your way to heaven? Nope. No, you can't do that either. Uh, so there's nothing you and I can do to get rid of our sin. Fortunately, God knows that. And God came up with a plan even before we were born. Before the world was created, God came up with a wonderful, amazing plan. And that plan involved Jesus, Jesus his son. So Jesus, you know, Jesus left heaven. Jesus is God. He's God the Son. He left heaven, came down to this earth. He was born as a little baby, grew up into a man. man. But there was something different about Jesus. He never did anything wrong. He never sinned. He led a perfect life. Never sinned even one little teeny tiny time. But even though he was perfect, what happened to him? He was taken by some men and he was put on a cross. And how was he put on the cross? He was nailed there. He was nailed onto a cross. And when they put the nails in, what, what happened? Blood came out. That's right. The Bible tells us without the giving of blood, there can be no forgiveness for sins. So even though Jesus was perfect, he willingly died on the cross, giving his blood to pay for your sins and mine. He took the punishment that you and I deserved, even though he did not deserve it. So he died on that cross. And they took him down, they buried him in a tomb, placed him in a tomb. But what happened three days later? He rose again. He rose again from the dead. He's alive today. And one of the reasons why God raised him from the dead was to show that God was satisfied that his blood paid for our sins. But is it enough just to know that Jesus lived, that he died, that he rose again? No. no. That doesn't get rid of your sin problem, does it? No. So how do you get rid of your sin problem? Then? We need to ask Jesus to be our Savior. We need to ask Jesus to be our Savior. The Bible says in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's right. So to be saved means that your sins will be forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse them, will wash them away, and you'll begin a brand new relationship with God. And when you die, you'll go to heaven to be with him forever and ever. So how do you get to the point where Jesus takes away your sin? Well, first you have to admit to God that you know you've done wrong things. Okay, admit to God that you've done wrong things, that you've sinned. that's important. You need that's to tell important. God that you know you've done wrong things. That's right. Second. You need to believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again. So you have to admit to God you've sinned, believe that Jesus died for you and came alive again. And then the third one is? And then you choose. You choose to, to ask Jesus to be your Savior, to take away your sins. You confess your sins to him and you choose to ask him to be your savior and when you do that the bible says when you believe on the lord jesus when you ask him to take away your sin that god himself will come to live inside of you and so as we put that in there now do you see any more dark squares no, no, or I rectangles see, see, do you, are, is it dark you see the dark there no no no, it's, it's kind of a pink color, yeah, there, isn't it's, it? it's a nice light pink. So what that means is when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus, you know, God comes to live inside of you. And as God is living inside of you, he's going to kind of begin to show up. People are going to see, because the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become, become new. So when Jesus comes to live inside of you, he helps you to live a better life. And as people look at you, they not only see you, but they see Jesus. Jesus living through you. Now, there's another verse in Peter that says that we are to grow, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So living things grow. Now, how do we grow in our knowledge of Jesus? By reading the Bible. Okay, you read the Bible. And praying. You take time to talk to him to pray church uh, when you go to church or even watch the online service right. and so now we have uh, we have green here because green represents things that are growing yes and so when you take time to read the Bible each day when you take time to talk with God when you spend time with other Christians listen to Christian music 
All that kind of stuff will help you to grow and you'll be doing what God says. And when you are growing, you're gonna have joy, you're gonna have peace in your life, you're gonna have contentment. And does that mean that everything's gonna go really well, you're never gonna have any problems? No. No. But even with the problems. God will be there to help you. God will be there, he'll walk you through every single one of them, but he will still give you joy and peace even in the midst of problems and difficulties. Right. So if you've not yet believed on Jesus, we hope that you will. And if you have believed on Jesus, we hope that you take time to get to know him better, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Well, here we are at the end of another Takuma Island Online. We're glad you joined us once again. Yes, we are. And we hope that you listen carefully to the lesson. And, you know, I was thinking, we could, every time we get hungry, we could let it remind us of the importance of God, God's word That's as, as well. Yeah. I mean, we need physical food to help us physically, right. but we also need spiritual food. So maybe take that time exactly. as you find yourself getting hungry and ready to eat food, yeah. physical food, take the time to maybe read a Bible verse or think about a Bible verse or yeah. talk to God. Yeah, that's a great idea. Important things, you know, because we all get hungry yeah, and true. we all like to eat. I don't think there's anybody that doesn't like to eat. And the importance of that physical and spiritual food in our lives is what's going to make us balance out. Yes, and the thing that I really like about that story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 is he told the disciples to do something that was impossible for them to do. Right. But because they listened to him and did what he asked them to do, they did the impossible. And that's the way it works with us. When you listen to God, read his word, and then do what he asks you to do, you can do things you thought you never could do before. Okay. Well, we hope you have a great week. Yes, we Stay do. safe, stay well. Bye-bye. Catch you next week.